Good afternoon, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Even towards the back? Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. James Brooks, Melanie Trent de Shutter Library Director here at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this special Women's History Month lecture in our Scholars Series programming. We wish to acknowledge the generosity of former trustee Anne Worrell, who endowed this lecture series in honor of our former president and CEO, Dr. Charles Bryan. Just before we start today with, uh, before we begin with today's program, uh, I'd just like to let you know about a few upcoming events here at the museum. So on Tuesday, April 2nd at 7 p.m., you can join the education team from the comfort of your home as they work to myth bust the 2009 film, Julie and Julia, which of course ties in with our most recent exhibition about Julia Child. So you can watch the film in advance and then log into an interactive Zoom presentation where the education team will talk about what's true, what's not, 
and make connections to our collections. The next day on Wednesday, April 3rd, we're going to be hosting our next noontime lecture here in the Robbins Forum. And Dr. Rachel Williams, who's an associate professor at the University of Alabama, will be here to talk about her most recent publication titled Hidden in Plain Sight, Concealing Enslavement in American Visual Culture. And now on to today's program. So just before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to ask you all to make sure that you've checked that your phones are set to do not disturb or silent. And we'll begin. Jane Spurgeon was a patriot who supported the American Revolution, while her husband was a loyalist who fought for Great Britain. When the conflict drew to a close, William left his family, leaving Jane to keep the home she and her children were at risk of losing because of his Toryism. This fight inspired her to demand the common rights of other citizens, which was a radical statement for a woman in revolutionary America. Through the story of Jane Spurgeon, Dr. Cynthia Kerner, a professor of history at George Mason University, joins us today to show how the revolution not only toppled long established political hierarchies, but also strained familial ties and drew women into the public sphere where they could claim citizenship and greater rights. Cindy has published widely in the fields of early America, women's history, and the history of disasters. Her previous works include Scandal at Bazaar, Rumor and Reputation in Jefferson's America, and the award-winning Martha Jefferson Randolph, daughter of Monticello. Her life and times, excuse me. Cynthia's latest book is titled The Tory's Wife, A Woman and Her Family in Revolutionary America, and will form the subject of today's talk. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Cindy. I always love being at this institution in this terrific room and the fact that you invited me here today to talk about North Carolina. Um, it kind of makes it even more special, I guess. I don't know. Um, I'm obviously not from there, as you've probably figured out by now. All right. So most of us who are interested in history, I think, are pretty much in it for the stories. So I'm going to begin by telling two stories. The first, a very, very short one about me, and then a much longer one about a woman in her family during the American Revolution. In other words, the story that's the topic of my book. Um, and then we'll move on to consider what we can learn from the story of Jane Spurgeon, AKA the Tory's wife. So I first encountered Jane Spurgeon in the North Carolina State Archives in Raleigh way back in the 1990s. And at the time, I was reading women's petitions to their state legislatures, just really hoping to find some who wrote about the revolution, what it meant to them, and how they thought about stuff like liberty and rights and all of those sorts of things. Um, I actually found very little of that kind of rhetoric, mostly because I think the women who petitioned were smart enough to know that they stood a much better chance of getting help from their government if they describe themselves as frail and helpless. In other words, if they justified their request on the basis of their needs as dependents rather than on the basis of their rights as citizens. The only exception to that pattern in North Carolina, at least, um, and by the way, I don't think I found any in Virginia, um, was my woman, Jane Spurgeon. Between, 18, between 1785 and 19, in, in 1791, um, she submitted a series of three increasingly demanding petitions to the state legislature. And in her final petition, she went so far as to criticize the government and the men who ran it and to describe herself as someone who found it, and I'm quoting now, extremely hard to be deprived of the common rights of other citizens. Um, that might not seem like a lot, but for the time uh, for a woman to use that sort of language um, in confrontation with public officials um, was actually really unusual. It was even kind of radical for the time. Equally important, Jane also boldly declared that in contrast to her husband, she had always, and I'm quoting again, behaved herself as a good citizen and well attached to the government. In other words, as one of her neighbors recalled years later, she was as true a Whig as her husband was a Tory. 
She was badass. I mean that as a compliment. So I wanted to find out more about Jane Spurgeon since the 1990s, and my book is my attempt to do that, um, despite the fact that, as you'll see, there are very few sources to document her life. So first, some very basic background. Jane Wellborn Spurgeon was born in Maryland in 1736. She married a fellow Marylander in the 1750s and moved with him and their firstborn child to Rowan County in what was then the extreme western part of North Carolina in 1757. Um, I can't show you a picture of either Jane or her husband, William, um, because only very wealthy people would have had their portraits painted, painted, and also because they lived in a place that was so remote that there would have been few, if any, artists wandering around offer, offering to paint people's portraits. Um, also, although both Jane and William were literate, there is no existing archive of Spurgeon family papers. And all of this is a very long way of, of sort of preparing you for the most boring PowerPoint that you have ever seen because we, 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 don't, we don't have pictures, um, no pictures. Um, what I can show you is a map of how the Spurgeons and a lot of other families from Pennsylvania, Western Maryland, Virginia, migrated down the Great Wagon Road, which was near more or less near present day Interstate 81, and they go southward to settle in the Carolina backcountry in the mid 18th century. Um, I know that West Virginia did not exist until 1863. Um, and there is a much more accurate map in my book. However, the map in my book did not appear very clear in a PowerPoint. So cut me a little slack. Um, Jane and William settled with some of their Maryland neighbors and they own property on both sides of the Potomac River, so some of these people would have been from the Virginia side as well. They settle in an area called Abbott's Creek, and Abbott's Creek is this little red blob on the map near the town of Salisbury um, in Rowan County. Um, the North Carolina backcountry at this time was the fastest growing part of the fastest growing colony in British colonial America. So thousands and thousands of people are arriving in this area during the 1750s. And Jane and her family prospered in North Carolina. William ended up acquiring roughly 700 acres of land, which was more than three times what he had owned in Maryland and Virginia, um, where the land was more expensive. Their family grew. By 1776, Jane had given birth to 11, count them, 11 surviving children. Um, judging by the spaces in births, I feel confident in saying there was probably one miscarriage or stillbirth kind of in between. Um, the stalwarts also, the, the Spurgeons also became stalwart members of, of the thriving Ab Abbott's Creek Baptist Church community that, that formed um, in the area. But most impressive of all, I think, was the fact that by 1764, less than a decade after he arrived in North Carolina, William Spurgeon was appointed as one of Rowan County's justices of the peace, which made him one of the leading men in the county. William wasn't nearly as wealthy as some of his fellow justices, um, and these really wealthy justices made a lot of their money by corrupt practices that eventually caused a rebellion among the local farmers, um, and these local farmers were known as the regulators. You may have heard of them. William and Jane seem to have been um, quietly sympathetic toward the regulator movements, um, and in fact, two of Jane's own brothers were, were involved in that movement. One of them almost got executed, but he kind of managed to avoid that. So while people in coastal towns like Wilmington and New Bern, not to mention New York and Boston and Williamsburg, were doing things like protesting the Stamp Act and the Townsend duties and other offensive imperial policies during the 1760s, people in the back country where Jan and, Jane and William were, were much more preoccupied with the regulators. Um, the regulators were ultimately defeated at the Battle of Alamance in 1771. But here's the important part. In Rowan County, the same public officials who led the suppression of the regulators would be the men who emerged to lead the revolutionary movement. In fact, William Spurgeon was the only one of the county's justices of the peace who remained loyal to the king and who opposed the American Revolution. So all these other guys 
support the revolution. A lot of them are sworn enemies to the regulators. William kind of stays quiet during the regulation, um, but he was very much um, a loyalist. Oaths, like swearing oaths, were a really important way for revolutionaries to separate their friends from their foes. And when William refused to swear the oath of allegiance to the state of North Carolina and to the revolution, the Rowan County Committee of Safety declared him to be an enemy to his country. Um, there we go. That's, it did two at once. Okay, there it is. And there's the statement. You can see he's mentioned by name. He's not, he's devouring all connection um, with his county and he's declared an enemy to his country. Um, we don't know much about Jane's politics at this point because authorities did not require women to swear these oaths based on the assumption that women either didn't know or didn't care about politics, or if they did know or care, that they would simply follow their husband's political lead. As we shall see, that was not the case with Jane. So William did not not only not support the revolution, he actively opposed it. In January of 1776, he accepted the royal governor's call to raise a body of troops to fight for the king. And in February, he and his men were among the 800 or so loyalist or Tory militia who were routed by Patriot militia at the Battle of no Morse Creek Bridge. And that was in, North Car in the eastern part of North Carolina. And William ended up serving in the Loyalist militia for the entire duration of the war. He rose to the rank of colonel. Um, he fought in two more relatively major battles, and I'm using the term major loosely. These are battles with names that are actual proper nouns. Um, one was the Battle of Kettle Creek in Georgia in February 1779, which you've probably never heard of. Um, and the other you probably have heard of was the Battle of Guilford Courthouse at present day Greensboro, North Carolina in March, 1781. And so like, what's he doing the rest of the time? Well, in between, he's involved in a lot of smaller unnamed skirmishes and raids throughout the Carolinas. He seems to have spent a lot of the time during the war, like in the woods, like hiding out and trying to evade people who wanted to capture him. Um, but William also went home from time to time to see Jane and his family. And, and we know that because their 12th child was born in November 1777. And interestingly, he was named Josiah after um, Josiah Martin, who was the last royal governor of North Carolina. Um, the Spurgeon's 13th and final child, another son, named Jesse was born in 1780. So they're obviously still seeing each other, at least occasionally, um, during that period. Once the war began, um, new state governments throughout the United States imposed really severe penalties on Tory dissenters like William. In North Carolina, men who refused to take the loyalty oath were subject to four times the normal rate of taxation at a time when taxes were increasing at a really alarming rate due to the high cost of waging war. States also enacted laws that banished men who would not take the oath. In other words, kick them out. And if you didn't leave, you got arrested. Um, and the other really important thing they did was that they confiscated the estates or the property of these Tories. Um, though, and this is an important point, the laws they passed typically preserved one third of the man's property for his wife if she remained behind after he fled. So the wife became almost like a pretend widow because her husband um, was gone, but she was still there. And, and this kind of echoed the way the common law um, treated wid widows um, in the event of their husbands. They would get control of one third of the property, pretty much as a matter of course. As it turns out, William was a particularly notorious Tory. Um, and I find this really interesting because of course no one has ever heard of this guy today. Um, but when states passed these anti-Tory laws, very often they would have 
a list of people somewhere and say, look, these penalties apply to all Tories, but these are the guys that we really want to get. And so like on this list are people like royal governors, Supreme Court justices, um, incredibly wealthy merchants who were like fleeing during the war. And here we have William Spurgeon, who was one of only three people um, in the entire county of Rowan, which was huge at the time, um, to kind of make the list. So even though you've never heard of him, I had never heard of him, people in North Carolina had heard of him and they wanted this guy. Um, so he's mentioned by name in North Carolina's banishment and confiscation laws um, along all of these famous people. Even though the state never actually ended up confiscating his property, and he remained in North Carolina until 1790. In other words, seven years after the war was officially over. Nevertheless, Jane and her children suffered a lot as a result of William's political choices. She was the one that the tax collectors badgered for the payment of those quadruple punitive taxes, which apparently turned out to be an impossible burden because her household under William's name ended up on the county's list of tax delinquents and insolvents. When the war began in 1776, Jane was left at home with six kids aged 10 years old and younger. She also, as I've said, endured two pregnancies that resulted in the addition of two, main, two more infants during the war. Even with her brothers and her older sons and possibly one enslaved man to help run the farm, it, it must have been really difficult. And in fact, she later claimed that she was almost continually being harassed by soldiers because of William's politics. Um, also, the loss of William's labor um, and the continuing demand for food for the army um, meant that Jane and her children were, at least by her account, often close to starving during the war. So, unfortunately, it's kind of difficult to pinpoint exactly when Jane and William's political differences became irreconcilable. But by 1781, when the Carolina backcountry sort of suddenly becomes like a total war zone, like the main focus of the war, Jane and William were publicly known to be on different sides. So here's what we know. In March of 1781, Jane welcomed General Nathaniel Green, the American commander, to her home at Abbott's Creek and basically said, yeah, Nate, take a load off. You can stay with me. You know, your soldiers can stay on the farm and, and you know, that'll be great. Um, Jane also offered one of her sons um, to be one of General Green's scouts. At that very same moment, her husband, William, was in an encampment nearby of British soldiers and Tory militia. And so like they're like in these places that are really close to each other, clearly different vibes in these different places, right? Um, and in fact, the two sides would soon engage in battle at Guilford Courthouse. Um, and then a few months later in October at the Battle of Yorktown in Virginia, um, essentially the war ended, um, even though the peace tri treaty, as you know, wasn't signed until nearly two years later. So the end of the war was obviously kind of a big deal. Um, it secured American independence after all, um, but it left Jane Spurgeon and likely a whole lot of other people with some important unresolved problems. William didn't come home after the war, but he was still in North Carolina. So what's the status of their marriage? The state hadn't confiscated William's property, but yet there were those laws saying they were going to do it. Um, and anyway, Jane and her children found themselves on the verge of homelessness, on the verge of losing everything, because in fact, their home and the surrounding land had been claimed in a series of lawsuits by William's creditors. Um, now, William wasn't poor. Um, it's just that the way the economy operated was all based on, you know, sort of credit and debt. There's not a lot of cash happening um, in 18th century North Carolina. And because William was a banished outlaw, he had no standing to contest these lawsuits 
or to file suits against anyone who might have owed him money, which if they had paid him, he could have used that money to satisfy his debts. All of this meant was that Jane and her children faced imminent homelessness as they waited for William's creditors to enforce the various judgments against him. And so it's the struggle to save her home, to save at least a portion of her family's land, which led her to petition the legislature beginning in 1785. And so without these petitions, we would essentially know nothing about her. So here's the first one. Isn't it pretty? Um, you can get these online um, at the North Carolina State Archives now. You could not do that in the 1990s, but cool, right? So in December 1785, this is the first petition, and it's the one that I like to call the legalistic petition. The legislature considered Jane's first petition, and here she sought to establish her right to a widow's third of William's property. And in this petition, she characterized her husband as politically dead. He had been banished after all. And she revealed that she did not expect him to return home to assist in the maintenance of herself and her eight small children. By the way, she kind of inflated the number of small children. I guess she figured no one would check, and they didn't. Um, Jane, again, legalistically cited the confiscation laws provision that wives, widows, and children of any person whose estate was or could be confiscated would get one third of the property. And then she went on to explain about the lawsuits that threatened to deprive her of that one third. In this petition, she's citing the law, she's trusting the law, she's trusting the state, and she submitted the matter to what she called the humane and upright disposition of the General Assembly. Um, she must have been both surprised you know, frankly, super pissed off when the assembly rejected her petition, which is what happened. So I like to kind of imagine her going home to Abbott's Creek and sitting around and stewing for the next three years. Because three years later, in 1788, she's back again petitioning the assembly. And this is the petition that I like to call the indignant petition or the angry petition. Even as she recounted the calamities and hardships that she and her children had suffered because of what she called William's bad conduct, she's now taking a much more critical view of the state. She's demanding rather than expecting that its officials act honorably. And so here's a quote. Other women, other women under the same circumstances are not treated in so hard a matter, nor can your petitioner believe it to be the meaning of the law to make the wife and children entirely miserable on the account of the husband's and father's transgressions. Um, you'll see here, the, the circle is around her signature, so we know that she was in fact literate. All those signatures on the bottom are men who signed in support of her petition. And interestingly, insofar as I can tell who these men were, they're all these very obscure farmers. Um, some of them were Whigs, some of them were Tories. Most of them just tried to stay out of the revolution as best they can. And, and we would consider them either neutral or apathetic. Even with all the support of these men, um, and even with her, you know, indignation, um, a legislative committee endorsed the passage of a law to assist Jane and other women who found themselves in these kind of situations, but the assembly never acted on the committee's recommendation. So she goes home for another three years and really stews. This one's the money petition. This one's the one that really made me sit up and think, wow, you know, this woman is really something special. Um, it's the one I call the rights petition. So in her third and final petition in 1791, her approach changed in two important respects. Firstly, rather than simply condemning William's political choices, she presented herself as a totally separate political actor, separate, distinct from her Tory husband, both in terms of her beliefs and in terms of her behavior. She asserted 
that she had, quote, always behaved herself as a good citizen. That word is significant, citizen. Um, she described herself as being well attached to the revolutionary government of the state of North Carolina, unlike her husband. Second, though Jane still played the gender card at least a little bit, claiming that she was old, she wasn't that old, um, infirm, maybe she was, had six children to, to provide for still inflating the kids a little. Um, she now stated her case though as a right, specifically a right to property, which is something that she, like a lot of American, a lot of other Americans, but probably most other Americans, probably actually all other Americans, um, saw as essential to the right of citizenship, this idea of property rights. Um, and this is where she uses that phrase, all I want is the common rights of other citizens. We can try to figure out what exactly that means in the Q&A. Although the legislature never formally responded to this petition, not long afterward, the state land office issued a grant in Jane's own name for 400 acres in Abbott's Creek, which included the site of her house. So she actually ended up getting more than a third. Um, and I don't exactly know why, because there's no documentation. I mean, I think it's probably like, I'm just, like, just stop, have this woman bother us. Let's get rid of her. Let's give her some land. I don't know. Nobody, nobody commented. So a legal definition, a legal petition, an indignant petition, and a rights-oriented petition. Um, it's really, really tempting to me, and maybe to you, since it's Women's History Month, um, to read something more than desperation and exasperation into Jane's evolving and increasingly radical rhetoric. Um, my take on her, though, is not that she was a proto-feminist or anything like that, but rather that she was a woman who just really resented legal arrangements that penalized good women who were married to bad or stupid men. Um, and that she also resented authorities, people in power who, in her view, didn't make good on their promises. Um, I mean, it's worth noting that Jane became indignant only when the state refused to give her the rights that were written in its own statutes, that one third dower portion of her husband's property. Even if she didn't expect to be the equal of men, and I, and I don't think that she did, she saw herself as a member of North Carolina's political community, as someone whose problems and concerns more warranted the sympathy and the attention of the state's elected governors. It's also note, worth noting that by the time Jane submitted her third petition, her position was more like a widow than it ever had been. She was now an abandoned wife, and her relationship with William was effectively over. In November of 1787, William became a father yet again. But Jane was not the mother of this new infant son, who was born to a woman named Anne Bedsall Ruddick, who was a much younger woman who also happened to be married um, and had had a bunch of children in Virginia um, with her husband, a guy named Solomon. Um, and they lived on the Virginia side of North Carolina's northern border. And um, the Library of Virginia actually has Solomon's divorce petition that you can read. He's like, I'm going to dump this woman. And, and they don't give him a divorce, which is really incredible. Um, anyway, um, William and Anne's relationship probably began when he was on the run and hiding from his Whig enemies during the 1780s. The Spurgeon separation then was finalized in, seven, by, in 1790 when William left North Carolina for Canada. He finally left and Anne and their young child soon followed. And William and Anne lived together as husband and wife in Canada where they had three more children together and presumably lived happily ever after. I don't know. Um, neither Jane nor William, unlike Solomon Ruddick, um, ever sought a formal dissolution of their marriage. William obviously secured a de facto of divorce by leaving the state with Anne. Um, but why did Jane not divorce William? I mean, the guy had made her life miserable for over a decade. Well, for one thing, she might have known that she was unlikely to receive a formal divorce 
The state of North Carolina had never granted one and in fact did not grant one until 1794. Jane also might have known that women who sought divorces mostly did so um, to shield any property they had or any property they would acquire from the claims of their estranged husbands. But the state's land grant to Jane in her own name in 1792 had solved that problem. Hmm. So what do we make of all this? Well, several things, I think. For one thing, I think the Spurgeon story gives us significant insights into the impact of war on family life beyond kind of the obvious, right? You know, the obvious, um, like, separation, death, economic scarcities. I mean, we know all that. Um, most historians today see the War of Independence um, as a brutal civil war. Um, the Spurgeon story suggests that the same war that, as the cliche goes, pitted brother against brother, could also pit husband against wife. And once you start looking for these people and you're reading like other people's books, they pop up. There are others. Um, the Spurgeons were not typical, but they certainly were not unique in that regard either. Secondly, we might ask whether the disorders of war might have provided a convenient opportunity for people in unhappy marriages to go their separate ways. Fragmentary evidence from a later chapter in the Spurgeon family drama suggests that the dissolution of Jane and William's marriage might have been consensual. So Jane stays in Rowan County at Abbott's Creek, um, where she died in 1803. Um, but most of her sons moved west. And when they moved west, they settled in southeastern Indiana, which news to me um, was actually a really common place for people from North Carolina to move to. After William died in Canada in 1806, Anne left Canada, and she moved to that same part of southeastern Indiana with her and William's sons. Okay, this is just so weird. Otter still, in 1799, Anne's estranged husband, poor Solomon, who didn't get his divorce, left Virginia with a woman named Amy. That's all we know about her. Solomon, Amy, and Solomon's sons by Anne all relocated to the same part of southeastern Indiana. So let me recap. Okay, so I do have a picture. This is the area that we're talking about. And who is living there? William and Jane's sons, William and Anne's sons, Anne and Solomon's sons. Okay, just super. I mean, would you do that? Just very strange. Okay, so, I mean, you know, we got to ask. Um, was this very, I think, unlikely gathering of characters from the Spurgeon family drama in such close proximity to each other? D did it mean that maybe the breakup of these two marriages, the Spurgeons and the Ruddocks, the breakup of these families left no hard feelings, even among men who as children would have been abandoned by a parent as a result of William and Anne's elopement? Did it mean maybe that the parting of the Spurgeons and maybe even the parting of the Ruddocks had perhaps been consensual, that the disorders of war and the penalties incurred by Will William's Toryism had simply facilitated the informal dissolution of their marriages more discreetly and without the social stigmas that were usually attached or financial penalties that were usually attached to marital split ups during this period? Um, was post-revolutionary migration, which historians usually see as economically motivated, was it also a potential way of obtaining what we might think of, um, and a phrase that I just adore from a really old book um, by the historian Suzanne Lebsock, a do-it-yourself divorce. I love that phrase. Third, um, Jane Spurgeon was obviously far from a typical backcountry farm woman, but I think her experiences show how the revolution tested and in some cases transformed both personal and political relationships. Um, before the revolution, Jane had a seemingly stable marriage um, and no documented political voice whatsoever. When it was over, she was a de facto single woman, she was a property owner, and she had publicly claimed what she called the common rights of other citizens. Whether these changes made her happy or sad, 
We'll never know, but they were important changes nonetheless. Finally, last but not least, um, I would argue that the Spurgeon story is a cautionary tale for researchers who are tempted to interpret laws and other official documents at face value. As historians, we tend to, we love documents and it's like, I can document this. I mean, even the use of that verb, um, you know, it, it just sort of gives something credibility. Um, in this case though, the supposedly banished William was often home in Rowan County, both, both, both during and after the war. Despite what the laws said, the state never sold his property. The state never even confiscated it. In 1785, here's a tidbit I didn't add, William was actually tried and found guilty of horse stealing, which was a capital crime at the time. And he was sentenced to death. There's an order of ex execution in the archives. But clearly, he managed to remain alive um, somewhere in Rowan County until at least 1790, when the U.S. Census listed him as residing there in a household separate from Jane's. And Jane, whose three petitions are marked as either rejected or not acted on in the state assembly's records, ended up with 400 acres, which she passed on to her oldest son when she died in 1803. And that's her tombstone. And um, I went down to find the tombstone with a friend. We drove all the way there. You know, you ever use findagrave.com? It's awesome. That's how we found it. And, and we get there, we drive all the way to still middle of nowhere, North Carolina, and there's this fence that says, do not enter. And I'm like, the hell with that. You watch for the cops. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> Did you find any evidence that all these sons in Southeast Indiana ever interacted? No, I didn't. But, okay, so I guess the way that you would find that out would be to look for family letters. There are none. Um, I guess if I had wanted to write, like, a second book about these people or even a longer epilogue, I might have looked for, like, deeds or maybe wills, and I didn't. Um, but it seems to me that the way these people settled in Indiana – is very reminiscent of the way people settle the back country in places like North Carolina and Virginia. They migrate down that great wagon road in as extended families and even, you know, bring neighbors with them. And, and, and that's exactly what happens in Abbott's Creek. I mean, a lot of the people in Abbott's Creek, um, you know, we can find them in Frederick County, Maryland and Frederick County, Virginia before they end up there. And, and I think part of the reason for that is that they help each other clearing land and things like that. They, you know, form the nucleus of a new community. Um, and, you know, I mean, there aren't that many people in this county in Indiana. I think they would have had to have interacted. My question would be like, you know, what is the quality of that interaction? <gasps> You're the woman who ruined my life. Or, or was it like, okay, come on, you know, um, we knew you from back in the old country. I have no idea. But yeah, it would be super interesting to find out. I agree. So I answered your question, but not in a way that helps you very much. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so Jane got 400 acres. What happened to the rest of the property? Who am I talking to? Oh, over there. Um, the rest of the property um, went to the people who had the judgments against her. And again, I don't know how the authorities kind of convinced these guys. Like, for example, if one of them, you know, was supposed to get 300 acres, how did they convince him that, no, really, all you need is 200? I don't know how that happened. Um, but I do know that Jane's son increasingly, you know, over, over time, um, bought back um, some of the original family property so that when he died in the 1850s, um, he had a lot more property than his father would have had. And also like, 
ownership of a lot more enslaved people. So. I wondered if uh, Jane simply had bad political connections at the North Carolina legislature. I've, I've never looked at a, a, a wide variety of Tory uh, wives petitions, but I'm familiar with uh, Mercy Bedford, a couple of counties over in Rutherford, whose husband was a very prominent uh, Tory of uh, justice and a, a captain of militia. And in 1785, she was able to successfully petition the North Carolina legislature to have all of his lands uh, transferred to her and her children uh, since he had since he had left the, left the state and was in London at the time. Well, I think part of it is probably that. I mean, the Bedfords were a more politically connected family, and you know, and so he is a prominent Tory in a way that I, I mean, William was prominent in that you know he made the list. Um, but before the revolution, he was not an important political actor beyond Rowan County. So I think part of it is that. Um, part of it is um, also, I think, I know something about the Bedford case, but I kind of wonder what her sons did during the revolution. Because my sense is that in dealing with these cases, um, and I suspect that this is probably one of the reasons why Jane got her 400 acres. Um, there was a real sense after the war of, you know, kind of respect for the transmission of property from father to son. I mean, even if the father was a banished Tory. Um, and also, I think probably the idea that, that um, if these were young men who really hadn't done anything serious, particularly if they were members of the kind of respectable classes, right? Um, it, these were people that you wanted as citizens in the future. Um, and so I think it's probably all of the above. Um, I, I also think that Jane's case was actually really complicated um, in that it wasn't, she wasn't, and I'm not, I'm sure she understood this, but I'm not sure that she or like the people who were advising her understood the legal complexities she wasn't simply asking the state to give back land that they had confiscated, which would have been a really easy thing to do. I mean, they might not have wanted to do it, but it would have been easy to make that happen. Um, this was way more complicated because there were either three or four men um, who had litigated um, you know, their cases against William and they had won. And she had appealed them repeatedly and kind of sympathetic courts would put stays on the transfer of property. So there were other people who were involved and, you know, these other people were owed something. Um, and I'm not sure that they got anything. The one guy was like super wealthy, so it probably didn't matter. The others, I'm, I'm not quite so sure. It was, it was a complicated case. And, you know, I, I actually wrote about these petitions for the first time, like in the 1990s. And I go back now and, and just very little bits. I go back now and you read what I wrote and most of it's wrong because it's so much more complicated than, than I ever thought it was. And, um, and then I'm sure, you know, it, I, I mean, I'm sure in her mind, she was like, well, give them some other land. Don't give them my land. Um, but she couldn't really say that. What a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, but I wanted to follow up on something that you um, suggested we could talk about in the Q&A, which is her language when she says the common rights of citizens. Can you elaborate on what that means? Yeah, that's a really good question, right? I mean, this is like Abigail Adams, remember the ladies. You know, I mean, people have made careers basically debating, well, did she want the right to vote? Did she want property rights? Did she want, you know, what did she want? Um, I mean, I think that, okay, I think there's the easy answer to that question is, and again, I did not know this decades ago, when you do a deep dive into Rowan County revolutionary history and, and the kind of Tories there. So like one of the other people, who was named um, it, when I showed you the list of like the really bad guys that they wanted to get. The, one of the other three people in Rowan County was this guy named Matthias Sappinger. And Sappinger also went to Morse Creek Bridge, but unlike William, he got captured. And so he got captured and they take a lot of these captured people as far away as Philadelphia because they don't want them like causing trouble in North Carolina. I'm sure the people in Philadelphia really appreciated that. But at some point, 
he escapes from Philadelphia and he goes to New York, which of course is occupied during the war. And he's like hanging out in New York and he dies. So clearly he's not coming home. His property has been confiscated. And his widow, Catherine, who is like a neighbor of the Spurgeons, um, sort of does what she has to do. She doesn't petition. I, I, I think it just sort of happens that she gets her widow's third. And Jane is sitting home at Abbott's Creek and seeing this happening. And, you know, and so she's got to be saying in her head, well, William is a Tory. Matthias was a Tory. William was at Moore's Creek. Matthias was at Moore's Creek. Um, you know, Matthias is dead. William might as well be dead. Um, you know, so like, why am I not getting my widow's third? So the common rights of other citizens, I think the timing of it, the language is is referencing the Catherine Savinger case without saying, my friend Catherine says, you know, which would have been like weird. Um, the other thing is, and, and I think the more important question is, um, you know, what does she think the common rights of other citizens, particularly for white women, what are they? Um, and I've struggled with this, but I think there's several things. First of all, that when the state authority passes laws that have specific either rules or entitlements for women, they need to do what they say. Um, secondly, that women, or at least certain categories of women, have property rights. Um, and that those property rights was one of the most important things that the revolution was about. The third thing I think she's saying is that, well, petitioners actually going back to medieval times, right, always have the right to petition. I mean, you could be like a serf, right? You know, an illiterate serf in England, and you could petition the king or the lord or whatever. Um, so, but I think, you know, in a revolutionary environment, she's saying more than that because that's nothing, right? I mean, I, she's theoretically at least always had that right. Um, I think by saying the common rights of other citizens, she's saying not only do I have the right to petition, but I have the right to be heard. And when I say that I'm suffering, and when I say that I only want you to follow your laws, because I'm a member of this political community, um, I have the right to be heard and to be taken seriously. And, and I think that, I think that that's a convincing answer, at least in part, because remember, not all white men have the right to vote at this time. And, and so she's not asking for the right to vote, um, I, don't, I don't think so. And people say that about Abigail Adams, too. But she is asking for, you know, rights as a member of this political community. And I think, um, you know, that during the revolutionary period, the language of citizenship is the way people talked about being members of that community. So does that work for you? Oh, she's not answering. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> What would have uh, happened to William if he had just come back home and uh, started a new life and they freed uh, the, the independent colonies? That is a terrific question because you would think, right? You would think that they're fighting this bitter war for all of these years. Um, you would think that banished meant banished. And we don't want you guys back. You were the enemy. You were doing, you know, you, you were killing your neighbors. Um, in fact, I mean, people who work on loyalists, who do research on loyalists, um, in recent years have found that a lot of these people do manage to come back and sort of, um, so some of them do it by like going to like different towns, right? Where they're not quite as notorious. So like William, instead of going back to Abbott's Creek, he maybe could have gone to Charlotte or somewhere like that. Um, or he could have gone to Virginia and just sort of, you know, I mean, that's the great thing about moving, right? You get to reinvent yourself. And so you either say, oh yeah, you know, I was in the war and just kind of leave it go with that. Um, you know, it, it, but the really interesting thing is that a lot of historians have found that a lot of these people actually do go back 
to their original homes and they managed to live among their neighbors. And again, of the three guys in Rowan County who were listed in that lawsuit, one is Matthias Sappinger, who dies in New York. One is William, who runs off with Anne to Canada. And the other um, is this guy named Morgan. Oh, damn, I'm blanking on his name. But anyway, he, he is a member of like a very important family um, in, in that community. And he is probably, I mean, you know, Cornwallis writes about him and basically says, look, he's the most important Tory in the area. He's the guy who's going to get us troops. He's the guy who's going to win battles. Um, and, and he is much better at doing both of those things than, than William Spurgeon ever was. Um, and he comes back after the war and people, I mean, he's very quiet. I mean, it's not like he's attempting to run for political office or anything like that, but what I've read about him is that he was such a good neighbor prior to the war and such an important person in that community um, that people truly believed that he had chosen that particular side because he thought it was the honorable thing to do. Um, and they let him come home and he lived in the county for the rest of his life. So in William's case, to get back to your question, um, I mean, I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure the horse stealing thing didn't help. Um, but, but I think like maybe if he had come home after the war and just sort of behaved himself, the Moravians actually thought very highly of him. Um, thank God Moravians like wrote stuff down because this is how we know a lot about what's going on um, in Rowan County and their records have been translated into English and published. And um, I think during the colonial period, William was the justice of the peace who was located closest to the Moravian settlements. Um, and the Moravians were pretty, you know, straight laced, moralistic, honest people. Um, and whenever they said anything about William, they had good things to say about him. Um, and again, he's not one of the justices of the peace that the regulators are complaining about. So I think, you know, if he, you know, if he hadn't like, you know, impregnated another man's wife and stolen horses and stuff like that, he probably could have come home. But, you know, <laughs> he did those things. So, you know, oh, Canada. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I have um, two questions. Uh, I'm curious about the mechanics of Jane filing her petitions. Did she do it oh. independently or was she using a lawyer or some other legal agent? Not a, not a lawyer. Um, I mean, it was one of the reasons why um, there's like a time lag on this thing. Well, whatever. Um, one of the reasons why the, the um, maybe I can do this. No, that's not working either. One of the reasons why the, the, the handwriting, I mean, you might not think so, but the handwriting in the peti petitions is actually pretty decent. Um, and the reason why it is, is because um, they use clerks. And um, so the mechanics of it would have been, and this is true even for somebody who presumably would have been you know, like educated more formally, right? Um, people did not pen their own petitions. They they went to like a clerk or a scribe or whatever, and they dictated what it was they wanted to say. Um, was she advised about how to say it? Um, certainly in terms of the, the formulaic beginnings of ends of petitions, which were always the same, of course, she would have been. Um, you know, in terms of the bodies of the petitions, I, I have the feeling that she was advised, but she said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, because, you know, like I said, virtually every woman who petitioned the state legislature, some of whom were successful, did the whole thing that, oh, I'm poor, I'm frail, I'm helpless, I've got, you know, blah, 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 can you please help me? And she didn't go that route. I mean, I could very easily imagine her, you know, having a conversation with maybe, you know, a brother-in-law or a clerk or something. Um, and, and her saying, no, I mean, this is the way I want to say it. And the guy saying, do you really want to do that? Do you think that's a smart way to approach 
um, the most powerful people in the state. And, and I mean, I don't think it was a smart way to approach the most powerful people in the state. Um, you know, I, I mean, nobody actually commented on the language of her petitions, um, but I'm thinking that if they did, they'd be like, what's with this woman? You know, I mean, doesn't she know how this is done? And so anybody using these kind of documents, it's always a very tricky thing, right? I mean, how much of it is coming from the petitioner and how much of it is coming from, from the scribe, from the clerk, from the advisors or, or what have you? Um, I'm actually weirdly more confident that hers are coming for, from her just because they are really different. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I can kind of imagine, you know, men telling her, you know, that this is not the smartest argument to make and her saying, but, oh, but this is the argument that, that I want to make, um, you know, but so that's, does that answer the question? Um, oh, and, and I mean, I guess after that, after the petition is written, it has to get brought to wherever the North Carolina legislature is meeting and they're like moving like all the time. Um, but usually it's brought to the legislature by a local representative. So you would have had to have some sort of connections at the local level. And then it's just sort of put in the pile and it goes to a committee um, and all of that. Yeah. That's all we're going to have time for in the forum today, but Cindy's going to be in Commonwealth Hall in just a few moments, signing books and answering any more questions you might have. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs>